principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III has been provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who've left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby chats with one of Missouri's most renowned equestrians, Tom Bass. Born a slave, Tom would break the color barrier, socialize with notable Americans and international royalty, and even revolutionize the way horses are trained. In 1859, in Boone County, central Missouri, a boy was born to a slave mother and the son of a prominent local white free landowner. The young man, the father, William Bass, didn't even visit the mother or his slave son for a month. But that boy grew up to be Missouri's greatest horseman and perhaps America's greatest horseman. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Bass, the founder of the American Royal. Now, Mr. Bass. Yes, sir. You became a legend in your lifetime. But this being a Missouri legend, the first legendary story is about mules. The mule I believe you're referring to is Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Yes, Mr. Potts was the family mule, was my grandfather's mule. And uh, my grandfather often said that if someone came up to him and offered him a nickel, Mr. Potts would be gone. <laughs> he had an ill disposition and uh, had, a, had a tendency to sit down on the job. And, and, and so this uh, unbudgeable, sit down and pull upon the jobable uh, mule was your mule. Your father, your, your grandfather gave you this, this mule? He gave me a task, and he thought that uh, I needed something to occupy and, and, my and time. And how, how old were you? We're talking about what age are you at this point? Uh, about eight years old. Eight, eight years Maybe old. Close to nine. So your first training experience? Well, I had, I had spent some time in the stables there at the Bass Farm and had watched the other men train the horses and had some experience with it. Uh, but my grandfather decided I needed a task, and Mr. Potts was getting a little fat, so he said he thought he'd need a little exercise. So he set me upon that. And, and, and how did you train this animal, this, this unbudgeable, sit-down-on-the-job animal? Well, Mr. Potts, I thought, you know, what he needed was just a little bit of exercise, so I, I thought, we'll take him this one day, I'll, I'll take him, and we'll go down to the pasture and round up the milk cows, and so I got the saddle, and and the bridle and got him all set and got on him and we got just past the cabin when he decided to sit down. <laughs> right in the middle of the road and I slid off and landed flat on my back. I was so mad and I went to the barn and got myself a good length of heavy rope. You got a length of rope and, and uh, what, what did you intend to hang that mule? <laughs> <laughs> That's what my grandfather thought at first. Uh, he saw me going with it and when I took it and I tied one end around his neck, he said, you know, boy, you have better luck tying that thing around that oak tree and trying to pull it up if you think you're going to pull up Mr. Potts. But I was determined, and I took the rope, and I, I, I strung it along the length of his back, and then I had to work it up underneath his rump. Now, he was sitting, so I, this took a little work. I had to rock him back and slip it under, and he'd rock back, and I'd rock him over and slip a little more under. Eventually, I got it under him and out between his legs, and uh, I picked up that end of the rope. Ouch. And, yes. <laughs> put it over my shoulder and got a little bit of a running start and gave it a good heave. And it gave a little bit of a burn to those nether regions right, yeah, of Mr. Yeah, yeah. Potts. I can see, so, yeah. He so, stood right up, I, quick as a wink, I was on his back and gave another little tug and we were off down the road to the pasture and I could still hear my grandfather laughing. Your, your father, your white father, uh, William Bass, he, he, he was also a horseman. Mm, he was. And, and uh, you, you, you watched him with this uh, horse, Helen McGregor. Helen McGregor. Uh, who was, who was the, the finest horse in the, uh, in the Bass stables at, uh, at that point, and he let you work with Helen, Helen Mack and, and ride Helen Mack and train Helen Mack, and, but then he took him out to, 
to ride in the fair. Of course, no, there were no black riders in those days in, in shows like the, the, the uh, uh, Boone County Fair that where, was it. Mm -hmm. where, where uh, he would show that horse. So he took Hel Helen McGregor himself to, mm -hmm. the, to the fair. He did. He, and, uh, he took me along to kind of work as a stable boy, get a little experience, I think also with kind of a good luck charm. And so I watched, and this was the very first horse show I'd ever seen, and it was just amazing. The, 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 the feats that these horses were doing, I, I, I loved it all. And then I watched Helen Mack ride out there, and she lost. And, and you're, as, a, as a very young boy, you're going to these horse fairs in Boone County and around central Missouri, and, and uh, you get to know some of the, some of the folks at mm -hmm. these shows. And, and, and another Mr. Potts comes along, not Mr. Potts the mule, but Mr. Joseph Potts. Yes. And he, he, he sees your work and, and, and is impressed by it. Well, our first meeting was, I believe, at the Boone County Fair, and I heard him talking back in the stables. And he was a big, boisterous man. He was there with his partner, who was very, very quiet, Cyrus, Cyrus Clark. Cyrus Clark, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about the horses. And Potts thing, and Clark. Yes, exi exactly. And, and Mr. Potts was talking about his, uh, his $1,000 horses. Well, $1,000, more money I could even imagine. So I kind of blurted out from behind him, I sure would like to see one of those $1,000 horses. And he turned and he looked at me and said, what? so what do you do? And I was way too shy to say I trained horses. So I said, I'll do just about anything to be around horses. He says, you take this card and you go to the Ringo Hotel. I love the sound of that, the Ringo Hotel. <laughs> the Ringo yeah. Hotel. And you look up a man named Lewis Horde and you give him this card and you tell him I sent you. So I did. Uh, it took me about three days to, to hitch and to, to hike all the way up there. And by the time I, I walked into Mexico, Missouri, I looked like I'd walked from California. I was so dusty and dirty. I went straight into the uh, hotel and gave him the card. And uh, he said he just so happened to be looking for a bellhop. And at the time, the bellhops would ride the buggy over to the train depot and pick up the guests and the, the baggage and take it back to the hotel. I did that, and the folks complimented me how good they, I was they, about they, the horses. You got a chance to show what you could do yeah, with horses. That I, I was good with horses. These renegade horses, which they, they thought they couldn't train, there was one in particular where you were very young at this point, so they said, you better go in with a pitchfork. Blazing mm. Black, is that the name of the horse? Well, Blazing Black, I had found her out in a pasture. And I saw her kind of standing off all alone and all the other horses were away from her. So she, and stunningly beautiful horse, just achingly beautiful. And so I went to the farm and asked about, could I purchase her? And he said he'd take just about anything. She was the, the meanest, orneriest animal he knew. So I took her and I tied her to the buggy and I brought her in. And she seemed to not trust the men. It took about five or six men to get her into the stall. She was kicking and stomping. And, and I knew it was just from ill treatment. So I. They told me, you know, if you're going to go into that stall, be careful. This, this horse looks like a killer. You might take a pitchfork with you. I took the pitchfork with me. She saw it and immediately put her head down, so I knew she knew what a pitchfork was. So I put it away, and I put out my hand, and I let her smell it. And I said, no more whips, and I walked out. And I just did that day after day, take a step in. She'd get all riled up. She'd settle down. I'd leave come back in the next day, take another step in. She gets riled up, settles down, I leave. And we did that for a long time. Eventually, they let her out the pasture because they thought she was too much time and trouble to work. But we would need her again. You know, today we talk about horse whisperers. Really, you're the, you're the for, first of the horse whisperers. You, 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 got, you got to know those horses and they got to know you, that you paid attention to them and so they paid attention to you. But we still haven't gotten to this important moment in the history of American horsemanship and American horse shows when you ride for the first time in a show that had only been ridden in by white riders. Yes. And, and that's for Potts and Clark. Yes. They're desperate to, to, uh, to get horses into a show. They don't have enough horses, and you volunteer. Well, I mean, it was one of those situations where they had no choice. Uh, there was Blazing Black, this beautiful, wonderful, th their most talented horse. And they knew it. They knew this was the best horse and their best chances to win. The problem with it was that the only person that could ride Blazing Black was me. So they were stuck. <laughs> now, what do they do? As Clark put it, we got this little colored boy and we have an all-white show. What do we do? And Joseph Potts said, well, the horse world better get ready for some big surprises. <laughs> and they put me in the show. You know, there, there's, there's another thing besides the riding and the training uh, in your career that you became famous for. And we've talked about your relationship to the horses and how you cared for the, 
uh, the horses. And, uh, and that's uh, something that's still with us, and it's called the bass bit. An, an adjustable, uh, curved? Well, it was. Uh, it, it, was it was a gentler one, and, and, it, and it actually started with blazing black. I've been playing with bits before, but with blazing black, I came up with the idea of a much more curved bit that would gently rub and nudge against the roof of the mouth. That's all they needed was a little nudge. The other ones before had hard angles and were cut into the mouths, and the pain is what drove a horse to turn. And, and so you patented this bit and made a lot of money on it. No, sir. You didn't. No, sir. And, and, and why not? I mean, I understand Mr. Potts thought it was a, a pretty good idea and well, encouraged you to do that. He, asked, he had asked about, you know, the, the secret behind Blazing Black, and I said one of the secrets is this bit. At that time, bits only came in small, medium, and large. That was it. There was very little variation. Now imagine if shoes only came in small, medium, and large. If you were any size in between, you were out of luck. Your feet hurt or they, they swole up, and that's how it was with these bits. And so I started making bits that fit the horses. And adjusted, yeah. And so I showed it to mouth. Mr. Potts, and he said, you could be a rich man if you patent this. And I said, I wasn't interested in patenting. Why? Because it was my gift to the horse. I wanted any person that would put this into a horse's mouth to take it. I would, I, would, I would let it go for the cost, that it, what it cost me to make it. Yeah. Because if I can make their lives better, thank you. If I can make their lives better, <laughs> through this simple thing, this simple thing, they have given me so much. Uh, it, tell the corn kernel story. Well, I had met Angie Jewell. She was a former school teacher from St. Louis, and she'd moved to Mexico, Missouri. Your with grandfather, I'm sure, appreciated the fact that you married a school teacher. You're probably a little surprised. <laughs> the, the, he was yeah. very surprised, yeah. actually. He thought, well, finally, the boy will get an education. And uh, she knew I'd struggled with my, my reading and my writing, but um, she didn't know how bad I was with arithmetic. And I mean, I could count. I just couldn't do it on paper. So I'd come up with a system. And the system was, each morning before I would go out, I would get a bag of corn kernels. And I'd count out these kernels. And each kernel represented how many dollars I had. And so when I would go to make a transaction or uh, to buy a horse, the man would tell me how much the horse was worth. And then I would say, well, I'll think about it. And I'd go, back, go off and I'd open up my bag of kernels and I, I'd count out the kernels. So I'd figure out how much change I was supposed to get or give and how much I had left over. And I know it's a slow, for anyone that can do math, this is a slow and awkward and often inaccurate system. Also a little system. dangerous if you've got corn kernels around horses, right? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> One time I was looking at purchasing this beautiful colt, and we were talk, I was talking to the farmer, and the colt started to notice the bag of corn kernels at my side, and the farmer asked me, what is that? And I said, well, it's a bag of corn kernels. He said, well, can my horse have some? I couldn't say no. So I opened up the bag and watched the colt eat my arithmetic system. <laughs> I had to go all the way back home. I was so upset. And Angie Jewell found out about that. So she and took you on as a project? She did. She said, we're going to fix this. And she went into the closet and got out her old textbooks and set them down and said, this weekend, we're gonna, you're going to learn how to add, subtract, and multiply and divide. And we did. Well. So she helped you because you, you wanted to go into business for yourself, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Joseph Potts and Cyrus Clark encouraged you too, and they Angie did. Helped, helped you out, and your uh, cousin, your uncle, Wesley Gray, helped, helped you out as well. And you started in Mexico, Missouri, started the, the Bass Stables. Yes, about and, four acres of land. And, and Clark, or the Harrison Stables, mm -hmm. they've all got these great horses. The mm -hmm. Harrison Stables had Rex Denmark, the great, greatest horse And that's what I needed. Time. Thornton Star was mm -hmm. the, the greatest horse that Potts and Clark had, so you needed a horse like I that. Did, I did. I needed a brag yeah. horse. A brag horse, they, yeah. they, they, they called it. And, and you did discover one. In fact, I discover did. is an important word here. Did discover you? is the exact word. I happened to be riding along the countryside uh, one summer, and I, I, I saw this little white gelding, and it was darting through this herd of cows. And it would dart through the, the herd of cows and look back to see if one of the calves would chase it. And they love to play, but they, all horses like to play. But what I noted was this horse had incredible agility and was the fastest horse I'd ever seen for a horse that young. And I bought that horse for about $100 and, and brought it back to Angie Jewell. And that horse was named? I told Angie Jewell, I'm going to name this horse Columbus. And she looked at me, Columbus? And I said, yes, Columbus discovered America, and I discovered Columbus. <laughs> it was a great and, horse, though. And Columbus became, of course, a world-famous horse. Oh, absolutely. And Buffalo Bill 
yes. Buffalo Bill Cody was looking for a horse to take on his European tour. He needed the best horse he could find. So he showed up in your stable to, to look in, for a in horse. Mexico, Missouri. I came back from a business trip, and uh, Angie said, we have a very important guest in the parlor. I went in, and there he was, big as life, Buffalo Bill. Sitting in the chair, had the buckskin jacket on and the lace up boots and the big wide brimmed hat and the long hair. And he said he wanted the finest horse he could find because he was going on a, a big European tour. So I took him out to the stables. Now I knew he would want Columbus from the get go. Part of me hated to get rid of Columbus, but you can't get too attached to these horses because, you know, you're in the business of horse sales. So we look at all the horses, and of course, he lands on Columbus, this beautiful 1,200 pound gelding that's just gorgeous. And he says, this is the one. And he had some financial difficulties, but had me promise to never sell that horse to anyone but him. Which and he I did. Didn't. And I a did. few years later, he did come back. He did. And, he did. He bought Columbus. And he was always, Buffalo Bill was always close to you. In fact, one time he, he came down, he uh, was going to visit a young friend of his mm -hmm. who was at the Kemper Military Academy. Sorry, I had to throw that in. <laughs> uh, the uh, Kemper Military Academy, and he brought that young man who was uh, a horse fancier, though he's better with a rope than he was oh, with, much better a, with, with a horse, <laughs> uh, to see you. And that young man, that little undergraduate at, at Kemper Military Academy was... Will Rogers. Will Rogers. Yeah, a nice yeah. young man. Yeah. And Angie had asked him to stay for dinner, and he was so impressed with Angie's cooking that he said, I'm going to sing for my supper. And he pulled out a guitar, and he had a really fine voice, that boy. And did the most amazing rope, rope tricks, tricks I'd ever yeah. seen. You know, I well, thought this boy's going to be something. We stayed friends, lifelong friends. So, wonderful, wonderful man. So you, you, you're becoming pretty famous at, at, at this point. So there's a group of Kansas Cityans, uh, uh, you know, people like Arthur Stillwell, who founded the Kansas City Southern mm -hmm. Railway. And the Commercial R Club. R.A. Long, the Commercial Club, mm -hmm. the predecessor of the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. R.A. Long, the lumber baron, they, they show up in Mexico to ask you to come and, and uh, have a stable in, in Kansas City, have, build your horse business in Kansas City, train horses in Kansas City so Kansas City can become a horse uh, center. They and, said they wanted a first class, uh, first class horse stable and livery here, and uh, would I please come? And uh, I talked to Angie about it. Now, we both Love Mexico, Missouri, and I, I, it was so hard to leave. I mean, this was home. This is, this, this, is, this is where my roots are, and the same for Angie. But we knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So we thought we'd come up here to Kansas City and build a little nest egg. And so we opened a, a livery at, uh, right at the edge of Westport, uh, way, way south, 39th and Main. Way, way south. south. Yeah, right way, at the edge of south. the city. No, oh, there was nothing but pastures around us. And, 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 and so you brought some, uh, some of the most famous people in the horse world or any world uh, came to the stable at, at the, uh, the, the livery at, at 39th and Main, the, the Bushes. The Bushes came? Not, not the George Bushes, but the Adolph and August Bushes. Oh, yes, from, 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 from St. Louis. Beer Bushes. Mm -hmm. Marshall Field from mm -hmm. Chicago came. And now presidents. You had a relationship with almost every president of the United States from Grover <laughs> Cleveland on, isn't that right? Well, this is true, and a lot of them I met before they were president, like Teddy Roosevelt. When I met him here in Kansas City, he was coming on business. I believe he was the police commissioner in New York then. And he said he was looking for a good horse, and he saw me on Jack of Diamonds and, and made me promise that I'd find him a good horse. And it took a few years because it takes a while sometimes to get the right man with the right horse. But eventually well, the, I did find him that one that must have been gilding. most difficult was President Taft, who weighed, weighed about 400 pounds. That took, yeah, that took some doing. That took some doing. But we it, found this big mare big, for him. Big horse. Yes. Very big horse. Yes. And I, I thought we might have to send a staircase like one of these along. To, but Taft wired me back and said he got on the horse just fine and thanked me for it. You were known as the founder of the American Royal. And in, and in fact, the American Royal started as a horse show related to the fire department. Yes, did it, it did. not? Now, now I, I helped found it. I, I didn't found it all on my own. I helped found it. I had uh, been asked. You're a was, legend now. We get to we get, <laughs> you, you found it. You can say whatever you want. Well, during that time I was here in Kansas City, I was asked to be on the advisory board for the fire department because in, that, in those days, horses pulled the pumpers. And uh, Kansas City's fire department and the city council decided they were tired of being second best to places like St. Louis or, or New York City, where they had these fine draft horses that pulled these huge pumpers. And the draft horses were, were, the, were the, the, the horses of choice because they could carry these heavy, heavy loads over great distances at great speeds. And the best ones came from Germany. So Chief Hale, the fire chief, George Hale, had decided that he wanted to go over and purchase some of these horses and learn some of their fire techniques. And this was all fine and well 
and the city council agreed to it, but they didn't have the funding. City council agreed to massive, expensive funding of the fire department. <laughs> How familiar that sounds. Well, oh, anyway, go ahead, sorry. Well, they didn't have the funds, and, and they were trying to figure it out, and I said, well, why don't you put on a horse show as a fundraiser? And they agreed to it. And so we did. The very first one was uh, an, in a big circus tent, and basically it was me on two different horses, and the members, uh, young members of the Tom Bass Club, which I had started here. The you Tom you Bass started Riding, riding Club, club for, for, for young, mm -hmm. young horse, horsemen and horsewomen, too. Yes, it, it grew out of that, and it was so popular that first time that it, they decided to do it each year. And then people like uh, Arthur Stilwell stepped up and, and would uh, offer these huge purses, the Stilwell Stake. And so suddenly we had this prestige, and we were able to compete with places like, like New York, Madison Square Garden, or St. Louis. Well, and and you were we the, had to move to Fairmont you, Park. It got you, so, you, you so were popular. The, you were the first black man to, to ride in Madison Square Garden, where, again, you, you won most of the ribbons. And you were invited to the Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair in Chicago, the greatest world, World's Fair ever, where, again, you won most of the, the ribbons. It, it makes it sound like it was pretty easy for you to break these racial barriers. That it wasn't wasn't such a problem. You'd ride in the in the great uh, train cars of R. A. Long or the Vanderbilts and uh, these private train cars. I did, and, and I did do that. And I was very fortunate to have uh, rich and influential friends that would help me that way. But one of the reasons I had to travel in these cars to do these shows with their horses was because of the Jim Crow laws. I mean, there were many places I couldn't travel, or eat, or sleep. And you know, as wonderful it was it was to win all these things for these folks. A lot of times they would come back and they'd congratulate me on these, 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 these triumphs that I had on their horses. And then they would go off to the fancy hotels to celebrate or the fancy restaurants and I'd go back and sleep in the stables with the horses, cook my cu uh, supper on a camp stove. So is there, there, there are many, many barriers that, uh, that you break and, and, and you know all these, uh, these great uh, figures, but there's some tragedy in this too because you are close to these horses and Columbus, uh, a, a, as, as an example, uh, it, it doesn't meet a, a, a happy end. No. And no, Columbus doesn't. Um, you know, as fearless as he was I, and as wonderful as he was, that. I hated for him to come to such a tragic end. Columbus was eventually sold by Buffalo Bill to Ringling Brothers, I believe. And they were storing Columbus in Augusta, Georgia. And uh, I came back from a business trip, and Angie told me that Columbus had died in a barn fire in Augusta, Georgia. And I have to tell you, a few years prior to that, I helped put out a barn fire in Mexico. And we were a pitiful little bucket brigade trying to put out this fire, and I will never ever forget the sound of those horses screaming. But for weeks after that, Angie said she would wake up in the middle of the night and find me gone from the bed, and I would be out wandering the barn smelling for smoke. And one night she found me and she said, um, she said, what's wrong, Tom? And I said, I could see his eyes. I can see his eyes, I can feel his terror. Poor Columbus. No animal should die like that. Well, you, you, you were always good to, to the animals, and they, and they were always uh, good to you. It's becoming the automobile age, and industrialization comes, and, and really that spells the end of the horse era. You were, I'm sure, sorry to see that, that go, sorry no. to see the automobile come and the horse go. No, sir, not at all. I had this conversation with a group of horsemen once. They were talking about that infernal contraption, the automobile. And they asked me, Tom, what do you think of the automo automobile? And I said, I think the automobile is a great thing and has come just on time. And they were shocked. Well, what are you talking about, Tom? You're talking about the death of us. You're talking about the death of the horse. And I said, no, sir. This is not the death of the horse. This is the emancipation of the horse. Just like I was freed, the automobile is going to free the horse. Because no more will the horse be whipped all day long to do things that are beyond its physical strength. No longer will horses have to carry soldiers into battle. No longer will horses have to plow endless fields day in and day out this back breaking. The automobile is going to be a great relief for the common horse. And now, horses will only be owned by those who love them and respect them. Right. So the, the Tom Bass career was a great, a great career, uh, a, a great career for horses and for riders and for horsemanship. 
uh, in this country. And you never stopped writing. Uh, you died on November 20th, uh, 1934, and your friend, Will Rogers, <clears throat> wrote an obituary that day. Tom Bass was a well-known Negro horseman, age 80, 75. He died in Mexico, Missouri today. Don't mean much to you, does it? You've seen lots of society folks, perhaps on beautiful three-gated horses or five-gated saddle horses, and you said, my, what skill and patience they must have had to train that animal. Well, all they did was ride him. Tom Bass trained them. For over 50 years, he was America's premier trainer. He trained thousands that others were applauded on. A remarkable man, a remarkable character. If old St. Peter is as wise as we give him credit for being, Tom, he will let you go in <clears throat> on horseback and give those folks a great show, and you'll get all the blue ribbons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the founder of the American Royal, Tom Bass. Tom's story kind of bridges two worlds. One is, is the horse world, but also this, this world of you know, leaving slavery and, and, and the reformation of America and dealing with Jim Crow. Before Jackie Robinson, before, before Rosa Parks decides to, you know, to, to sit down on a bus, Tom Bass is doing all these things in a very quiet kind of way. Uh, not making a big fuss of it, but really changing a, um, a very big world, which was the horse world. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III has been provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations.